an idea that every child should learn before they even go to school. And yet, most people go right through their life and never really understand it. Dr. Maxwell Maltz, around 1960, said it was the greatest psychological discovery of his generation. It's on self-image. You see, you and I have an image of ourselves. It's how we see ourselves. I know there's a reflection come back from the mirror. I can see me. That's a reflection of my physical being. But that's not how I see me. I see me in my mind. And it's based on information that I have on me. Now, some people have a lot of false information, so they've got a very false self-image. Around 1960, Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. Cybernetics was a new idea. Cybernetics was something that was discovered around the Second World War by a physicist and a, uh, and a mathematician, Weiner and Rosenblum. They didn't even have a name for it. And it was used for uh, heat-seeking missiles. And they pointed out that cybernetics is the science of control and communication in the animal and in some machines. And what it does, it measures deviation from a set goal sends information into a coordinating mechanism that'll correct the output and keep whatever it is moving towards the goal. Well, do you know you have a cybernetic mechanism locked up in you? Now that may, what I've just said, may not make any sense to you at all. But before you finish watching this video, it's going to make a lot of sense. Now, if you've heard me speaking at any, any event or in any video or audio, you've heard me talking about paradigms. Paradigms are are uh, nothing but a multitude of ideas, a multitude of habits that are fixed in the treasury of our subconscious. Paradigms are partly genetic and partly environmental. In other words, it, it's built, the ideas are built right into the genes at birth. That's why we look so much like our relatives. So when we tie all these together, it makes a very interesting story. And I'm gonna ask you to sit back, take notes if you want, but really pay attention. If you have kids in school, this is critical. If you're in sales, your sales will skyrocket. Relationships, just anything that you're going to do is dependent on how you see it. So let's think about it. Cybernetics and paradigms. Very, very interesting subject. Cybernetics and paradigms are both control systems that operate essentially on the same principle both maintain a definite course of action and will not deviate from the course that has been established. You must alter the paradigm to achieve the result that you desire. Now think about that for a moment. You'll see people stuck at a certain level. Go ask any sales manager to give you the names of their salespeople and they can tell you what those salespeople are going to do next month and next year. Why? Because they're programmed. They just come in about the same, maybe up and down a little, but they come in about the same. How about athletes? Every coach will tell you exactly how they're going to play. There's patterns. They're called habitual patterns. Well, that's a paradigm. Now, this is a beautiful concept, so let's understand it. Cybernetics and paradigms, all right? There's a thermostat. Now, a thermostat in your home is a cybernetic instrument. Now, I live in Toronto, so a good part of the year, it gets pretty cold there. Uh, other parts of the year, it gets pretty warm. But in the winter, you would have your thermostat set to control the room temperature at around 70 degrees. Now, you could be sitting there reading a book or something, and all of a sudden, you feel a draft around your feet, and, and you start to feel a little cool, and you think, what's going on? So you go and look at the thermometer, and you notice that the temperature is not 70, it's dropped to 65 degrees. You start to investigate, you think, what's wrong? And you'll notice the front door's open. Now, it used to be, when I was a little boy, you'd go and check on the furnace, because maybe the furnace had gone out. And you'd have to shake all the ashes down and build another fire and get it going again. Not today. Today, we've got cybernetic mechanisms hooked up to our heating system. You see, the thermostat measures the deviation from the set goal. What was the set goal? The set goal is 70. But the temperature is at 65. Things have changed. The thermostat sends a message to the furnace 
and automatically the fires turned on. The fans turned on and the temperature starts to rise. And it gets up to 66, 67, 68, 69. And it'll take it right back until it's back on course at 70 degrees. And then the fire and the fan are turned on. Now think of that. And it all happens automatically. That's a cybernetic mechanism. Interesting, isn't it? Do you know you've got a cybernetic mechanism in you? Let's look at it another way. Let's look up the sky. There's a big plane. Now, the automatic pilot on a commercial plane is a cybernetic instrument. That's exactly what it is. And you see, a flight pattern is programmed into the plane's computer system. When the plane goes off course, the cybernetic system measures the deviation from the set goal and it corrects the flight pattern. The plane is brought back on course. It's correct, 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 correct. Do you know a rocket going to the moon is off course 97% of the time? Let's take a look at it from a different perspective. There's a plane leaving Chicago and it's flying to Paris. Now, when the plane leaves the vicinity, it's just getting off the ground, you see the wheels are still down, it's just getting up there, the automatic pilot is flipped on. The pilot could come back and have dinner with you. Now, they don't leave the cockpit, but they're not necessarily doing it. It's all done automatically. And you see, when that plane's flying along, it gets hit by some turbulence, it gets knocked off course. Do you know what happens? The cybernetic mechanism cuts in. It's activated, and it puts the plane back on course again. It all happens automatically. The pilot doesn't even have to do anything. But ultimately, although it goes off course and gets knocked back on course, it ends up in Paris. Now think about that for a moment. Here's you. And you have locked in your subconscious mind a self-image. And that self-image operates like a uh, cybernetic mechanism. Okay? Your self-image is a cybernetic instrument. Now, let's suppose your self-image is that you are overweight. Well, you don't talk about it. You don't want anybody else to talk about it. But inside, you feel you're overweight. And you just get to a point where you can't handle it anymore, so you make a decision, I'm going to go on a diet, and you instantly move into action. Now, what happens? Well, you start to lose weight. Why? You're starving yourself. You don't eat anything white. And on and on we go. No more chocolate. Why? Because they make you fat. That's not what makes you fat. It's the image that makes you fat. If you had a skinny image, you could eat all the chocolate in the world. You just pass off what's not needed for the manifestation of the image through your eliminative system. Eliminative system is one of the systems in your body. Now here's the point. When a person who is overweight goes on a diet without changing or altering the self-image, any weight loss is temporary. That's why people gain and lose tons in a lifetime. Say they lose it, you're automatically programmed to find whatever you lose. The self-image, being a cybernetic instrument, measures the deviation from the set goal and immediately corrects the course. The weight that was lost will be found. You see, you look at the scales, you don't really, that's not really me. That's <laughs> not really me. So what happened? See, if you're going to change the weight, you've got to change the paradigm. That's what our company's all about. We help people change paradigms. We help them live in the body they want to live in. I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm at my perfect weight. I'm looking good. Now I'm feeling great. You can do that. You can live the way you want to live. You're God's highest form of creation. Where's another area that we could use? Well, you can use it in any area. Let's take a... Uh, a child in school. Now this is all in uh, Psycho-Cybernetics, Dr. Maxwell Maltz's book. And, and here's something else. What's the point of making heroic vows of amendment if the same old law is going to keep them? I am going to take the weight off. But you don't change the law breaker, the paradigm. Emerson was right. Of what use to make heroic vows of amendment if the same old law is going to keep them? Let's look at a student in school. All right? Now, there's the subconscious mind. Okay. And the student, the image, the child has an image. 
You see, the child's self-image is a cybernetic instrument. That's exactly what it is. And the child has an image of poor grades. This is biographical, by the way. It's that same image I used to have. And I got them. Sure did get them. And you see, when a person is receiving poor grades in school, it's, it's an expression of a self-image. It's the self-image they hold that they're expressing. The person believes they are not very bright. They, of course, receive a report card that reflects the poor image that they've got. And they take the report card home, and there's trouble in River City. I mean, I lived with this all the time I was in school. The child's grounded. They're made to study. Now, what the parent doesn't know and what the child doesn't know is really rather sad. See, the child cram, 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 and the marks go up. But what the parent and the child do not understand the parent un is unaware that the real problem has the child. They have them give up recreational activities. They make them study. The grades improve, but the improvement is temporary. Why? The child has never changed the self-image. The parent doesn't even understand self-image. In most cases, then certainly the child doesn't. And so what happens? Well, they got a good test. When the report card comes up, nothing's changed. Now, why would people live that way? They live that way because they don't know any different. And that is rather sad. See, we should learn to live the way we really want to live. We've got to understand this concept of self-image, of cybernetics, of paradise. You know, um, Oscar Wilde said something really beautiful one time. He said, selfishness is not living as one wishes to live. Selfishness is asking others to live. You've got to develop the courage, you've got to develop the awareness, the wisdom to live the way you really want to live. Life is very short. It's very fast. And you can have it in the end of your life. You're God's highest form of creation. If you really want to check in to programs that will change the course of your life forever, understand this. Myself, my associates, and our company spend all their time studying this. I have personally been studying the program for many years. We have some of the best programs in the world. Some of them run for a week, some run for a year, some run for an hour every day. But I'll tell you this, they'll have you running in the direction that you want to go for the rest of your life. Leave us your information. Let us talk to you. And absolutely refuse to spend another day living the way someone else wants you to live. With you. See, most people live the way they think other people think they should live. At the very best, that's going